Engines of the Past. Dear viewers, in 1921, the Northwestern Railway had a shortage of engines, so Sir Topham Hatt, the fat director, purchased an LNER Grizzly A1 White Elephant prototype named Henry in 1922 when he actually wanted a Great Central Railway Robinson 8B442 Atlantic and another Grizzly A1 prototype named Gordon in 1923. But as mentioned in the previous volume, due to a lack of funds, engines had to be loaned from other railways in the mainland. Besides 87546 and 9462, the other loaned engines of the past were Allegretti, Eagle, Afton, a little blue tank engine who teased James about his bootlaces, and so forth. While many fans interpreted their own takes on these, ahem, engines, these stories will describe them. The stories themselves take place before, in between, and after the previous volume, as well as the official Railway Series volume, The Three Railway Engines. Signed, The Author. Alan Greedy's Apples. Based on the original story by The Buried Truck, adapted, edited, and told by July Leonard. In the early years of the Northwestern Railway, Thomas and Edward came to the island of Sodor in 1915 to help with the construction of the railway. But as time went by, the NWR was short of engines, so the fat director had decided to purchase Henry in 1922 and Gordon in 1923. However, due to a lack of funds, other engines from other railways in the mainland had to be loaned. Three examples were 87546, 9462, and an LNER Robinson Class B4460 tender engine named Alad Greedy. Alad Greedy was painted bright red with yellow lining and black on the dome, four small wheels in front, six driving wheels at the back, and a six wheel coal tender at the very back and a loud mouth to match. He was primarily a mixed traffic engine and never seemed to take much notice of Edward, but everyone took no notice of Alec Greedy. They had to, for he seemed wouldn't stop boasting about himself. One night in Vickerstown Sheds, a couple of days after Edward pushed Gordon up the hill with a goods train, Alec Greedy was boasting as usual. Look at you all, he began, painting in drear greens and moanful blues. Luckily, I ought to bring some vibrance to this shed. Thomas and Edward chuckled quietly, but the others groaned dreadfully. One morning, Alec Greedy felt very pleased with himself. He kept a time, and the passengers told him how splendid he looked. He arrived at the shed and found Gordon being ready for his afternoon train. Not to fail spectacularly with another goods train, are you? <laughs> Alec guffled. Dear me, Gordon, how can an engine like you with a few measly trucks? I hope little Edward is at the ready, otherwise you will be in trouble. Edward gave a pity look, but Gordon harumphed and hissed away. There's no need to tease him, said Edward. He, oh hush. Alec glared. You come out of the shed for a few days and suddenly think you can tell me what to do? I'm the lifeblood of the mainline passenger trains, and don't you forget it. With my grace and expertise, I'll have the express... Oh, inter Edward interrupted. Is that why the coaches need their coupling hooks mended? When I went to fetch them, because of your... Uh, grace and expertise? Alec Greedy scowled, hidden himself in a cloud of steam, and pretended to be asleep. The next morning, the fat director came over to see Alec Greedy. You are to take a passenger train to Brendam Ducks, he said. But sir, objected Alec Greedy, I'm a mainline engine, not a branch line engine. Can't Edward do it? He's fittable for those type of lines. I'm sorry, came the reply. But it's my railway, and I give the orders. So Alec Greedy puffed sulkily away. He clunked into the station, still cross over Edward's remark. 
"Be gentle, be gentle!" cried the coaches. "Come quietly, come quietly!" Alec Greedy snorted as the guard's whistle blew. "Silly little engine!" he huffed. "I'll show him grace and expertise." Alec Greedy would show Edward something, just not what he hoped for. Along the Wellsworth branch line is a church with an orchard. The apple trees are well looked after to ensure their branches didn't obstruct the line. That morning, some of the church boys climbed a tree close to the railway. They thought they steal some apples while the vicar of Wellsworth was preparing his summer ceremony. Careful, careful, John," said one. "That branch doesn't look sturd very sturdy." "It's sturdy enough," said another one. "Just you be ready with to catch these apples." Soon, Alec Greedy came snorting along. He was still thinking what to say to Edward when they next met. "Come along, come along," he puffed. The boys saw him approaching. Startled, they scrambled frantically down the tree. The branch John stood on couldn't bear the weight any longer. As he jumped, it snapped, still clinging to the trunk, but dangling over the railway line. "Come along!" snarled Alec Greedy. "Come along!" Oh! Hearing the thud. The driver stopped the train. When he and the fireman came around in front, they laughed until they cried. "That's one way to get some peace and quiet, eh?" cackled the fireman. Apples were stuck in Alec Greedy's teeth. They and the branch muffled his cries with indignation. "Serves him right. All that boasting gave me a terrible headache," smirked the driver. All day, Alec Greedy traveled up and down the line. The apples and the branch stayed firmly in place. The passengers didn't think he was splendid now. They erupted with laughter as he passed. Alec's face turned red as his paint. Unlike the passengers, the vicar of Wellsworth wasn't laughing. When Alec next passed the orchard, "Give me back my apples, you thieving engine!" he cried. Alec tried to apologize, but all that came out was muffled gibberish. When the fat director visited Vickerstown Sheds that night, he wasn't laughing either. "This wasn't your fault," he said. "I've spoken to the vicar of Wellsworth and of keeping his boys in line. However," he went on, "I do not approve of the ruckus you've been causing. You will stay as you are until morning. Perhaps a night of ahem, quiet reflection will set you straight." He spun on his heel and strolled away. The other engine snickered. "I say, little Edward," winked Gordon. "What does the old saying go? 'An apple a day keeps the fat director away.'" It seems several bushfuls couldn't keep him from Alad," chuckled Edward. Alad Greedy had certainly gained expertise about apples, but fell far from grace. Alec Greedy felt embarrassed. The next morning, some workmen removed the apples and the branch off of his front end, and as soon as he was repaired, Alec Greedy went back to the L N E R in the mainland in disgrace, never to return. Now that he's gone, you can be sure we'll never hear any boasting from him for a very long time. Don't you? The Tale of Eagle. Written and told by July Leonard. After Alec Greedy was sent away back to the mainland by ship, the fat director had decided to bring in another tender engine. His name was Eagle. He was a Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Hughes Class Twenty Eight Two Six Zero Mongol, painted red with yellow and black lining, two small wheels in front, six driving wheels behind. And a six-wheel, thirty-five hundred-gallon Fowler tender with black on the tender wheels. He was mainly a mixed traffic engine, who seemed to be a friendly sort to the other engines and help them out when needed. The fat director was very pleased with Eagle. "You're doing very well for a mixed traffic engine," he said. "You are much more suitable, red engine, than the last one." Eagle beamed. "Oh, thank you, sir," he replied. One partly cloudy day, he was to take a local passenger train to the other end of the line at Knapford Station. 
Thomas, who was the station pilot shunting engine at the time, arranged his coaches. Here are your coaches, J e Eagle, he said. Good luck. Thank you, Thomas, came the reply. As soon as Eagle backed onto the coaches, the passengers boarded, the signal went green, the guard blew his whistle and waved his green flag, he took the string and set out of Vickerstown. He was soon enjoying himself flying along the line. Ah, yes, what a life, he complimented. Eventually, they reached Knapford. Eagle turned around on the turntable at Tidmouth, and they started back. Along the journey back, however, after passing Crovin's Gate, his driver noticed something outside the two-road tunnel near Vickerstown. Whoa there, Eagle, he said. Something's not right, he added, as he shut off steam and stopped the train. Henry's guard walked over to the cab. Henry has stopped at the other end of the tunnel, refusing to come out, he said. We've already tried pulling and pushing, but nothing worked. We'll do everything we can, replied Eagle's driver. Then they and the firemen walked over to the other side. Now Henry had stopped at the other end of the tunnel, because he was afraid that a few drops of rain would spoil his lovely green paint and red stripes. He stood there, refusing to move a yard and surrounded by a mob of angry passengers and even the fat director. They tried using a rope to pull and pushing from the other end, but it did no good. The two drivers, firemen, and guards even argued with him. Look, it has stopped raining, they all said. Yes, but it will begin again soon, said Henry. And what will become of my green paint red stripes then? The only option left was using Eagle. So they uncoupled him from his train and brought him up behind Henry. The fact director came out from the other end to watch. Right then, he said. You may push when ready. Here goes came the reply of determination as Eagle blew his whistle and started puffing and pushing. He pushed and puffed and puffed and pushed as hard as ever he could. But still, Henry stayed in the tunnel. Come on! Come on! Come on! He bellowed as smoke, steam, and sparks bellowed from his funnel and wheels. Finally, he gave up. No movement at all, he panted. I'm sorry, sir. The fat director was cross and walked back to Henry. Very well, Henry, he said at last. We shall leave you here for always and always and always. He then ordered, he, he then ordered Henry's coaches to be uncoupled and Eagle to take his train on. But what about my coaches, pondered Eagle. Edward will take your train for the time being came the sharp reply, and Eagle reluctantly accepted. A few days later, the fact director came over to Vickerstown Sheds to see Eagle. Eagle, I've just received word from your controller that you're needed back, he said. What's wrong with me being here? replied Eagle, puzzlingly. You've been a hard worker here. But it's time you return to the mainland, replied the fat director. I'm sure your controller will allow you to visit here for regular passenger and goods trains any other times, if I can make the arrangements. As you wish, sir. Eagle trundled sadly away. In the meanwhile, the fat director made arrangements with Eagle's controller on the phone about Eagle visiting his railway again for regular passengers and goods, and it was approved. Eagle would often sometimes would some Eagle would sometimes visit the Northwestern Railway for regular mixed traffic work, and he and Edward would stand up to the bigger engines for Thomas. And we can only hope that Eagle had always helped the other engines when in need to be really useful.
The Wandering Coach. Based on the original story by 22 Tesla, adapted, edited, and told by July Leonard. The Northwestern Railway had just been formed in 1915. The expense of Main Line, as well as the loop lines, reaching from Vickerstown to the end at Knapford, extending to Tidmouth, was going for a tough few years. The line's first two engines, Thomas and Edward, were too small to handle the workload. As such, the fat director had brought in two more engines named Henry and Gordon, as well as many more engines on loan from other railways in the mainland to help. And I'm sorry to say, frictions existed as some loaned engines, such as 87546, 98462, and Allied Greedy, treated the resident engines quite poorly. Oi! You! Take my coaches and hop to it! One engine would say. Hop to it yourself! I'm getting this train ready, Thomas scoffed. Hmm. Typical shunter. No sense of duty. Late again! I thought you're supposed to be an express engine, another engine wished. Don't blame me. It was a faulty signal, Edward huffed out of breath. Of course, it's always something else. You wouldn't have this kind of mess on the Northwestern Railway if your controller had any sense of progress. He'd allowed a head office to oversee anything. One of these engines was a large experimental prototype Clotin class from the LNWR in the mainland. This engine had glistening red paint with black side plates. He was named Afton and was more picky about the kind of coaches he was given. He saw all the old single axle coaching stock as relics. He was also appalled at the idea of pulling goods trains. Because to see a grand engine such as himself doing so was an insult. One morning, Afton pulled into Vickerstown Station. He was to be pulling the local stopping service today. But as he neared the station, he hissed angrily as he saw the coaches he'd been giving. He was given the small single axle coaches. While they were painted in the NWR cream and dark green, they were smaller and older than the bogey coaches given. What's this? he hissed. I'm pulling this ghastly groaning train today. The indignity of it all. Just be happy that you have a train to pull, Thomas hissed as he pushed the coaches. I had to hunt the yards for extra coaches. Then you can jolly well take these coaches away and bring me some proper coaches. I'm busy. Take them yourself or leave them. Thomas huffed and hurried away into the yards before Afton can say more. <sighs> Come on, old boy. Let's get this over with, Afton's driver sighed. The coaches groaned as Afton backed on them. They had heard Afton, who had called the, what had called them, and were not happy. Who is this rude engine? asked the lead coach. An improper engine if he's pulling us, said another. I'd rather be pulled by Edward or even Thomas. At least they are proper engines who know how to treat coaches right, the brake coach added. Shut up snapped Afton. I am a proper engine. Better than Tiny Thomas or Old Iron Edward. Now come along. The guard's whistle blew, and Afton huffed out of the station in a rage. His face was almost as red as his paint. As Afton raced down the line, the old coaches groaned and creaked. They are older and not used to running express speeds. They teared nervously as they rolled along. Slow down, slow down, they wailed. Shut up, shut up, Afton barked back. 
Just then the brakes on the train came on. Afton stopped suddenly on the viaduct near Kronk, grumbling dreadfully. An investigation of the coaches showed that the front coach, just behind Afton, had a loose vacuum hose. While the crew set about fixing the problem, Afton fumed angrily. He thought the coaches were doing that on purpose, making him late. Eventually, the brakes came off and the train puffed away. When Afton arrived at the terminus at Knapford, the big red engine hissed mournfully as he moved around the yard to shunt his own coaches away. The coaches tittered grumpily as he did so. At last, the journey is over, one said. I felt my windows were going to fall out, said another. At least, at least you two were further away from him than I was. I had to put up with his groaning all the way here, said the lead coach. It would have been better if you decided not to hold me up, you rotten old antique, replied Afton. What? You blame me for that? It was, that was your fault, came another reply. Pull the other one, you horrid thing sneered Afton. It's not my fault. You do not know how to pull coaches properly, you rotten red sausage, the front coach sneered back. Afton quickly lost his temper. His boiler pressure shot up amid the hiss from his safety valve. There was a bang and a splintering crash. Afton hadn't been paying attention when he entered the carriage sightings and had run his coaches into the buffers hard. The buffers were bent and broken, but they were not the most damaged. That honor belonged the, to the coach behind Afton's tender. It was squashed between him and the second coach, crushed into a pile of splintered wood and bent metal. The other coaches shrieked in horror at the fate of her sister. Afton just sniffed indignantly. This is what you get for being weak old antiques, he said. If you'd only been proper coaches, this wouldn't have happened. The fat director was not happy with Afton's carelessness and spoke to him severely. If you were my engine, he said, I'd send you away. But Afton just sniffed. He didn't care at all. He watched as the broken coach was loaded into some trucks to be taken away. The other coaches were silent during the whole process. After a while, Afton just smirked and backed away to Vickerstown sheds to rest. Afton's driver was assigned to another engine to learn how to properly handle coaches and Afton himself was shut in the sheds for a few weeks until the fat director has allowed him to pull trains again. The other visiting engines, including Alec Greedy, 87546 and 9462, weren't the only ones to show any sympathy for Afton and his careless handling. During his stay in the shed, a new train was offered by the Northwestern Railway. It was a late night train that offered an express run to Nutford called the Midnight Special. The bigger tender engines enjoyed the job immensely. The idea of a non-stop uh, express run from one side of the island of Sodor to the other under stars made them feel very important. Soon. It was Afton's turn to pull the Midnight Special. About time that I had a name train of my own to pull, and with proper coaches and no less. The only thing better would be the Express, he said loudly. The other engines just groaned. They ignored the big red engine's boasting until he left the shed. Afton pulled into the station bubbling with excitement as he buffered up to the lead coach. He was so excited that he never looked back at the rake of coaches he wasn't pulling. 
No one noticed the coach closest between Afton and a luggage van didn't belong in the consist. It was painted gr cream and green, but it ha was smaller and had no bogies, just two axles. It was filthier and didn't look like a coach belonging to a prestigious train such as the Midnight Special. The guard blew his whistle and the train set off. Over the sound of Afton pulling, there was loud groaning. There was a loud groaning noise that came from the lead coach. It sounded like that it hadn't been oiled in a long time. Soon the express passed over the signals and was going in a cloud of steam. A phone rang in the signal box in Kelsthorpe. When the signalman answered it. It was a call from the signalman at Kildane. He wanted to know. He wanted to know if the midnight special had passed through to check that the system was still operating. The councillor signalman said he received a bell from the Crovensgate signal box a long time ago, but the express hadn't come yet. He checked his watch. The express was running half an hour behind. Just before the signalman could hang up the phone to call Crovin's gate to send out a works train to check the line, there was a knock on his door. He opened it to see the midnight special's guard standing there, pa panting heavily. Have you seen our engine? he asked. What's engine? came the reply. No engine has been passing by my, sing my box for half an hour. The guard then went pale. That's not possible. You must. That's. That's not possible. You must be mistaken. I've just come from the midnight special, and I have not seen our engine anywhere. I swear, me manners, there had been no train puffed past this signal box. I wouldn't have seen it. Replied the signalman. Come on, come on in here. You've been speaking all kinds of rubbish. I'm not," retorted the guard. "Our tr our entire train is missing our engine. It's just like he's disappeared." "Come on, mate," said the guard. "Said the signalman. Have a cup of tea and explain what you're trying to say." A works train was soon dispatched from Crovin's Gate. They found all six express coaches and the luggage vans sitting on the main line neatly, and the irate passengers. From passenger testimony, they said one moment the train was running smoothly, then, after the two-road tunnel near Balahu, the train went slower and slower until the coaches ground grounded to a halt. When the passengers looked out the windows to see what the problem was, they saw there was no engine at the front of their train. Workmen investigated the coaches for damage, but none was found. The coupling on the luggage van was intact. While the works engine pulled the train back into the station, the workmen searched up the line. Perhaps the engine had derailed somewhere, and the guard just missed. However, nothing, no trace of an engine or even an accident, could ever be found. The engine crew was found the next morning, asleep on a bench at Crovin's Gate by a cleaner. Making the rounds before the first service of the day. When asked how they got there, they had no memory of what happened after Afton had en entered the tunnel. Just that, one minute, they were entering the tunnel, and the next, they were waking up on the platform. A massive search was held to look for the engine, but nothing could be found. For a long time, the Midnight Express was discontinued, as the more superstitious passengers refused to ride the express after midnight, worried that if a whole engine could vanish, then wind out a whole train of passengers. The mystery deepened when many of the passengers expressed concerns for the people who might have gotten in the first coach. The investigators noted. That all the, pa the coaches were still on the train, but the passengers were insistent that a, that a coach was missing from the express, a small coach just behind Afton. 
The station staff, porters, and the engine crew of Thomas, who assembled the train, who had gathered the rake of six express coaches, plus one luggage van, no more, no less. After extensive investigations, relief was brought to the passengers to hear that everyone who had bought a ticket for the Midnight Express was accounted for. But the mystery remained. What happened to the Afton and the alleged coach? How could his crew wake up at Crovens Gate Station with no memory of how they'd gotten there? To this day, the file remains in the Vickerstown Police Files as unsolved. However, they say that whenever midnight draws in, you can hear the puffing and whistling of an engine speeding past with a single axle coach and disappearing into the two-road tunnel near Balahu without a trace. Easton, the other tank engine. Based on the original story by Narrow Gage, adapted, edited, and told by July Leonard. Many engines have come and gone on the island of Sodor. For some, their time on the Northwestern Railway was so short that other engines would be forgiven who had forgotten them. This is a story about one of these those engines. It happened shortly after Thomas left to run his branch line. It had been a few days since James's incident. He was still shut up in the sheds as punishment and was desperate to come out. But neither the fat controller or any crews came near him. Despite James's absence, none of the engines were strained from extra work. There were still many loaned engines from other railways in the mainland. Some would only stay a day, while others could be around for a whole month or otherwise. A more recent visitor was a tank engine from East Anglia. With Thomas having a new responsibility, the fat controller was quick to find a new shunter for a big station. The engine's name was Easton. A small blue LNER Holden J69 tank engine with six wheels and yellow letters GER on both sides of his tanks, which stand for the former Great Eastern Railway in the mainland, which eventually would become part of the LNER in 1923. Compared to most tank engines at the time, he looked very stylish. I have arranged to have you here for two for the next two weeks, said the fact the fact controller said. If you do well, I'll be more than happy to have you be a part of my railway. Easton felt very excited and was eager to please. He arranged the coaches gently and hurried about the yards with heavy trucks. The bigger engines didn't say much to him, but they did appreciate that there was another engine to sort their trains. Overall said, his attitude left much to be desired, and it became very apparent on one particular day It had been a week since his arrival, and Eason was busy shunting on a long goods train for the other end of the line at Baron Furnace. As he stopped, he noticed a bright red engine that he'd never seen before, standing by the coal bunkers. He steamed up to Edward, who was nearby. Oi, Edward, he huffed. Who's that over there? Oh, um, that would be James. Seems the fat controllers finally let him out. Let him out? What do you mean? Easton asked, looking puzzled. Is he still stuck in the shed or something? Edward chuckled. Yes, well, it's a bit of a story. Once Edward had explained everything about the bootlace, Easton felt like he was going to wheeze with laughter. Even so, continued Edward, it's best not to keep reminding him of it. I'm sure he wants to make up for it, and become really useful. Edward puffed away. Easton did listen to what Edward said, but when he shunted James's goods train alongside him, he couldn't hold it in. Here are your trucks, James, he said. Have you got some bootlaces ready? And he ran off, laughing rudely, much to James's frustration. During the next week, 
D I mean, during the first week, Easton had come to understand most of the Fat Controller's engines. But one exception was the former shunter at Vickerstown. He was curious to know who he was and why exactly his position changed. Later that day, Easton was having a small rest in the carriage shed when he heard an unfamiliar whistle. To his surprise, there, pulling into Knapford Station, was another blue tank engine, an LBSCR Billington E2 for that matter. He is around the same size as Easton and had two LBSCR Stroudley four-wheel coaches in tow. Adding to this, they were filled with passengers, meaning he wasn't shunting a train, but pulling one. That evening at Tidmouth Sheds, Easton was quick to question Edward about it. That will be Thomas, he explained. He used to shunt coaches like you, but now he has his own branch line. His own branch line? exclaimed Easton. But he's a tank engine like me. How can he... How can he can get to pull trains and I can't? Because Thomas earned his branch line, grumbled Gordon, who was trying to rest. It was a reward for rescuing James from his crash in a cow field between Wellsworth and Crosby. But it's not fair. I've worked in yards for years. I deserve to pull trains after all that. Well, the, word, well, the world isn't quite that simple, retorted Gordon. If you want something, you work for it. Now please be quiet. And with that, he shut his eyes and went to sleep. Calm down, East. Calm down, Easton, whispered Edward. If you're patient and continue your good work, I'm sure the Fat Controller will give you other jobs. But Easton had no interest in patience. And I'm sorry to say that after that night, he would let his jealousy get the better of him. It was very apparent the next day. Easton was rushing about the yards and very rough with the trucks. This wasn't too unusual, but when he'd taken his anger out on the coaches, workmen and engines become concern became concerned. Eventually, the fat controller had to step in and spoke to Easton. I don't know what's wrong what's got you so wronged up, he said sternly, but I prefer to keep it to yourself. Easton did calm down a little after that, but he couldn't help feeling envious whenever he saw Thomas pass by. He tried to take his mind off of it by bringing all of his attention to the shunting, but it did little good. A few days later, Easton was having a little rest. His driver and fireman had gone to have some tea in the worker's hut, leaving him completely alone. Just then, the yard foreman walked up to him. Excuse me, he said. But when your crew returns, can you bring Thomas's coaches to the station? Why? asked Easton. He's just having a bit of trouble steaming up. He'll be fine, though he may be leaving a little late. If you get his coaches sorted, that'll save him some time. Must be off. And he hurried away to his office. He was so quick that he didn't notice a grin appearing on Easton's face. As he had an idea. He had thought it all through just as his crew returned. Driver, he called innocently. The foreman came over. He asked us to take Thomas's passenger train. The driver stared. You sure? He replied. Yes, it seems Thomas isn't steaming well and won't be ready in time. So we'll have to take it instead. The driver and fireman had doubts, but knowing how important the branch line trains are important, and there was little time to think it over. So they set off to the, for the carriage sheds. Thomas's coaches, Annie and Clarabelle, were very surprised to see a different blue tank engine buffering up to them. Who are you? cried Annie. Hello there. My name's Easton. Thomas isn't available at the moment, so I'll be your engine today. Before the coaches can reply, they were already out of the siding and off towards Knapford Station. At the platform, Easton watched with eagerness as the passengers boarded the train. This is wonderful, he thought. Finally, a whole train to myself. As soon as the guard blew his whistle, Easton hurried out of the station, very unsmoothly. Easton was enjoying himself immensely. Buildings and other landmarks lurked by, and he adored the cool breeze. 
The coaches and passengers, however, were having a different experience. Slow down, slow down, cried Annie and Clarabelle. We'll fly off, we'll fly off the rails at this speed. Nonsense, snapped Easton. I'm just keeping to time. The driver fought to control his engine, but it was no good. They continued at a fast and dangerous speed. It wasn't until the first station that Droyal came into view. That's enough, Easton, yelled the driver. We have to stop now. Easton's brakes came on, and after much squeaking and squealing, they finally came to a stop, but not overshooting the platform. You stupid engine, scolded the driver. Easton gulped. His confidence had dashed. Once they had backed up, the passengers stormed out of the train, feeling very sick and very cross. First that red engine, James, and now this, exclaimed a man. What is it with this ridiculous railway? Easton tried to speak up, but the constant buzz of furious voices drowned him out. Soon, the station master phoned the yards, and after a quick conversation, addressed the passengers. Everyone, may I please have your attention? My sincere apologies for what has happened. Another engine is on their way to take the over the train. Now Easton was more, even more nervous. He was certain who that engine would be. Then, sure enough, Pulling up alongside him was a red-faced tank engine. Oh, um, hello. Thomas, is it? stuttered Easton. I don't believe we had a proper chance to meet. What do you think you are doing? bellowed Thomas. Who do you think you are to steal my train and trying to run my branch line? His face went even more red when he saw the sorry state the coaches were in. And what have you done with Annie and Clarabelle? They need to be treated with the utmost care and respect. Seems like you don't know what those words mean. All right, Thomas, that's enough, interrupted the station master. He then turned to Easton. As for you, uncouple from the train and return to the yards at Knapford at once. Without another word, Easton did just that. When, arrived, when he arrived at the yards at Knapford, he found the fact controller waiting for him. I had high hopes for you, he began. You showed great potential when you started here. Even after you started acting rough, I thought you'd settle down once I had a word with you. And then you do this. I spoke with the foreman before he returned, and he made it very clear that you were told to just shun Thomas's train, not take it out. The driver was surprised. surprised. But sir... Easton told us that we had to take the train because Thomas couldn't. So you lied as well, boomed the fat controller. I'm sorry, sir, said Easton. I only wanted to take my own train, and when I saw another tank engine do it, I got jealous. And that is the very reason why you're far from ready to pull any train, retorted the fat controller. Thomas can have little patience, too, but he has great respect for coaches and his passengers. Perhaps one day you will learn that, but you will not be learning it here. Arrangements have already been made. You will return to your river tomorrow morning. For now, I want you in the sheds out of the way. Is that clear? It is, sir, whispered Easton, and he rolled away, feeling miserable. The following morning... Easton left the island of Soder behind. No one said goodbye, or at least saw him off. Nobody bothered, of course. He felt very ashamed. But he, but he knew, deep down, that the fat controller was right. There was a lot to learn indeed. The years passed. Nothing more about Easton was said until 1951, the fat controller had decided to give him another chance by being a maintenance engine, which made him become a better engine. He even brought the breakdown train to Wellsworth, after James had his accident with some tar tankers. At first, Easton started to enjoy his new job, but after a while, he eventually began to miss his old home on the mainland. His crew spoke to the fat controller, and he understood. So, arrangements were made, and Easton went back. I'm glad that he returned as a better engine, don't you? A Tale of Two Single Wheelers
Written and told by July Leonard. The Northwestern Railway's main line was very short of engines, so the fat director had decided to bring in two more engines to help out. These engines were both smaller than Thomas and Edward. No cabs, six-wheel tenders, and each of them had a 222 single wheel arrangement, meaning that they were both single wheelers. However, they bear different liveries and different names. The first one was an LNWR large bloomer class painted in vermilion red with brass fittings and a bit of copper on top of his funnel. The second one was an LBSCR Jenny lined 222 painted light green with red frames, gold fittings, a gold and black nameplate on both sides of his boiler, and bears a black mustache. These here are Bloomer and Ernest, the fat director announced. They will be helping out on the main line. Please make them feel welcome and show them around. He finished and walked away. Thomas and Edward never seen engines with a single wheel before. A pair of single wheelers? pondered Thomas. That's right, replied Bloomer. We were even built in the last century put in Ernest. And I thought I was old, chuckled Edward. Throughout the day, the two engines showed them everything. That night at Vickerston Town Sheds, they talked and laughed together like old friends. Eventually, they fell asleep. The next day, Bloomer was to pull a train filled with enthusiasts whilst Ernest was rostered to take a local stopping passenger train. Bloomer chose a rake of green and cream GNR Metropolitan four-wheel coaches. They enjoyed seeing the sights of the railway and taking photographs anywhere they stopped. They even got pictures of Ernest while he was passing by. The next day, after the enthusiasts had gone, the fat director had brought in a strange-looking man to Vickerstown Sheds. The man was a famous artist. He wore a black a barrette and a smart looking coat. He was also carrying some art supplies uh, and a wooden stand with an unpainted paint canvas. The engine that he chose was Ernest. They even positioned him at the tunnel between Vickerstown and Croven's Gate. The fat director even picked out a portrait of Ernest and hunted on the inside wall of his home of Topham Hall near Wellsworth and remains hung up ever since. Then in 1921, hard times came and people came to buy Bloomer and Ernest. Thomas, Edward, we want you to know that we're very proud of what you both done for this railway, said Bloomer. You two had become far greater engines than we e could ever hope to be. And please make the fat director's railway proud and give credit to it, added Ernest. Soon, they were off for the mainland to their new homes. Eventually, this had left the Northwestern Railway with great difficulty as the end of the war, with its military value, being ending and government support withdrawn. It also resulted in a locomotive crisis, and the fat director was placed in charge of finding new motive power. What about Bloomer and Ernest, you may ask? Well, Bloomer was bought by a, herit bought by a heritage railway, whilst Ernest was bought by a museum. I'm sure Thomas and Edward had fond memories with the two single-wheeled engines. Don't you? Alfred Written and told by July Leonard. While some engines were loaned from the LMS in the mainland, some engines were also loaned from the LNER as well. One of them was an inside cylinder tender engine named Alfred. Alfred was an LNER Holden Class B12 painted apple green with white and black lining, a yellow number three on both sides of his cab, and the letters L-N-E-R on both sides of his tender. He had four small wheels in front and six driving wheels behind. 
he was mainly an express passenger engine, of which he, sometimes he looks after the express the Wild Norwester when Gordon's not available. Alfred doesn't mind pulling goods trains, and he, like Eagle, treated other engines fairly. Whenever 87546 or 98462 are both, boast or bully other engines. He would put them in their places. One evening, as he backed down into Vickerstown sheds, he saw 98462 being spiteful towards Henry. That's enough, 9462, he snapped. 9462 jumped in shock. What's up to you, Alfred? he glared. Henry may have some steaming troubles, Alfred replied, but the fat director can make things right for him, so be quiet and go to sleep. 9462 said nothing as his face turned pale and did so. Don't listen to him, Henry, sympathized Alfred. Even though I share the same number with you, I wouldn't dare replace you. Besides, as I told 9462, your controller can make things right for you. And with that, he and Henry drifted off to sleep. The next morning, Alfred was sitting in a siding, waiting to take a goods train to the other end of the line at Knapford. As Thomas was getting his trucks ready, the station master walked across the yard to Alfred and his crew with urgent news. Hello, said the driver. What's happened? 9462 is stuck on the turntable, he panted. Some workmen are coming to fix it, but the coaches for the express to the Wild Norwester are standing at the platform, and Gordon's path has been blocked. Can you manage it? We'll give it a try, replied the fireman, but Alfred was concerned. But what about my goods train? he pondered. Henry will look after it for the time being. Replied the, the station master replied and walked away. Alfred backed onto the coaches as the passengers climbed aboard. As soon as the guard blew his whistle, Alfred took the strain and set out onto the open line. They were soon flying along the main line. The coaches and passengers cheered. Even the other engines were amazed at Alfred's performance as he whistled by. Eventually, they reached the terminus at Knapford. Alfred turned around on the turntable at Tidmouth Sheds and returned to Vickerstown, exhausted but triumphant. Gordon and 9462 stood at the platform as Alfred pulled in. As the passengers swarmed around Alfred, Gordon was impressed, but 9462 just scowled at him. Well, Alfred, he said darkly, you were able to handle the express by yourself. The fat director must be pleased with you, he added. The fat director is always pleased with those that have a good performance, Alfred replied. 9462 said nothing. Gordon just laughed as he sulked away back to the sheds. Later, as the engines arrived at the sheds, Henry spoke. Alfred, he said, thank you for sticking up against 9462 for me. It was nothing, Henry came the reply. As time went on, Alfred mainly worked on passenger trains as well as occasional goods trains. Then one day, Alfred was needed back on the LNER in the mainland. Well, be sad to miss you, Alfred, said Henry sadly. You did very well looking after the express for me, added Gordon. Thank you all for the compliments, Alfred replied as he departed for the mainland. The years passed. Henry, Gordon, and the other engines had began to miss Alfred, but one day, the engines were resting in Tidmouth sheds when the fat controller walked over to them. I've just received a letter from Alfred's new owner, whose name happens to be Queen Lucy, he said. The engines listened, and... But if I told you who Queen Lucy is, you probably wouldn't believe me, wouldn't you?